I'm in the business of uh, making new tools to, uh, to study the glycocalyx and uh, my primary interest is uh, to do this in cancer. So I've already heard quite a bit about uh, altered glycosylation in, uh, in cancer um, and it's associated with um, you know, more aggressive uh, cancer. So we focus actually on one main component for now which is sialic acid. And you probably all know um, what sialic acid is. It's a quite unusual monosaccharide. It has nine carbons. Um, and there, actually it's a, a family. There are over 50 different types of sialic acid. And they're primarily found at the termini of glycoconjugates, primarily in an o um, uh, glycoproteins and also on glycolipids. Glycan chains. So it's also the first thing that uh, pathogens interact with. Um, and they're very important um, in controlling the immune response. It's an important differentiator between self and non self. Um, so, studying silic acid in the context of cancer is very interesting because actually, for a long time, it's been known that um, silic acid is aberrantly expressed on cancer cells and it's actually upregulated um, in, in cancer. So uh, what, this is associated with a host of um, different things, such as an increase in uh, migration, um, uh, which is helped by this uh, addition of sialic acid. Also resistance to radiotherapy and chemotherapy has been associated with, uh, with oversilylation, um, as well as apoptotic uh, evasion. So it's clear that oversilylation is really helping the tumor to survive. Um, but our main interest is actually at looking at its role in immunology. So tumors create a tumor microenvironment which is highly immune, immune uh, suppressive. So there's a lot of interest in immunotherapy against cancer and it's very difficult because these tumors they actively suppress um, the immune system locally. This is also caused by oversilylation. So it makes sense actually to just remove the silic acid from the tumors and this should um, yeah, alleviate that. Now, we're not the first to come up with this idea. Actually, about 50 years ago, people have tried this with uh, quite some success. This went into clinical trials. Um, basically, they used um, enzymes, silidases, that could cleave the silic acid. So the results were quite promising, but there were some obvious problems with using this uh, silidases. They were of bacterial origin. So they're often contaminated. The effect only takes place on the outside of the cell, so it's short-lived. Um, and for us, it's difficult to study the effect on, uh, of the uh, immune response when we remove the silic acids. If we use a bacterial silidase, it could lead to immune responses by itself. So uh, just a few years back, uh, James Paulson published a really nice molecule. Um, this is an inhibitor of uh, silyl transferases. It uh, can be metabolically converted inside the cell to its CMP uh, variant. Um, so this molecule is acetylated to increase cell permeability. Inside the cell, the acetates are removed and the fluor ensures that uh, the CMP variant of this molecule um, cannot be transferred onto the protein. So we get blocking of silyl transferases. This leads to an accumulation of CMP silic acid, which induces a feedback um, on the uh, the novel biosynthesis of sialic acid and those two things combined result in a loss of sialic acid. Now this compound is very pure, we can make this without any contamination so we should in principle also be able to study the effects on the immune uh, response. First we just started by looking at some cancer cells, see if they would respond to this uh, inhibitor and they do. So we used uh, lectins to, to look for uh, sialic acid, here you can see in control we can clearly see a sialic acid is present on the cell membrane when we add this compound, the inhibitor, we no longer see this signal. Uh, we can do the reverse with PNA and GSL1, which recognize the underlying galactose, which can only be recognized if the silic acid is removed. So here we see in the control, we can't see galactose because it's capped. And when we add the inhibitor, we can nicely see the exposed galactose. Uh, we also use two lectins that recognize glucnac and fucose, and they are not affected, so it's a quite specific molecule. Okay, then we just see how this would work out in vivo. Um, so what we did is we um, 
yeah, we inoculated the tumor inside the mouse, and after 10 days, we start to inject this inhibitor into the tumor. Now, here you can see that if we inject PBS or uh, a paracetylated version of sialic acid that does not contain this fluorine, uh, we get complete killing after 40 days. But about 60% of the mice, they survive uh, after 40 days um, and show signs of remission. So it's clear that removing sialic acid from these tumor cells is uh, helping the mouse to combat the uh, cancer. Uh, we also saw a big effect on uh, metastasis of the primary tumor to the lungs. Here you can see the control uh, spreading of these uh, tumors to, uh, to the lungs. And this was greatly reduced indeed when we uh, treated the primary tumor with the inhibitor. Here you can see another representation. Okay, so the, the problem with this is now we know this works, but what's really the mechanism? We change quite a few things. We remove sialic acid that has some biophysical properties. We expose galactose, so galactin binding is more possible. Um, and actually there are quite a few instances where sialic acid is known to um, have a, a role in uh, immune regulation. Think about the complement system, for instance, uh, the recruitment um, of factor uh, H, which uh, inhibits uh, complement activation. Uh, there are a host of other types of uh, processes that are associated with uh, silic acid binding, but we were most interested in these receptors called Siglex. Um, so these are um, uh, yeah, immunosuppressive receptors present on uh, almost all immune cells. So, and there are quite a few different ones. There are more than 10 different Siglex uh, receptors. So it's a big family indeed, and some of them they can actively signal. Um, so they have an uh, intracellular domain that can uh, yeah, send immunosuppressive signals. Um, and for instance, uh, SIGLAC1 or cell adhesin cannot do that, it can only attach. Um, it's quite difficult to study SIGLAC binding, um, so we wanted to come up with some new uh, tools for that. So um, yeah, more than 10 years ago, Sergey Kelm published uh, research in which they modified silic acid with a, yeah, usually an aromatic, uh, relatively hydrophobic group. And they showed that they could actually increase uh, the binding uh, to Siglac2, for instance. And they could also have some selectivity between the human and the mouse uh, CD22. Um, later on, James Paulson uh, published quite recently a um, sort of an array screen in which he rapidly um, modified the silic acids using uh, click chemistry with a variety of these different aromatic uh, groups, and then you could identify high uh, affinity ligands. So this is all done on, basically on a chip, on glass, and our idea is to do this on the cell. So basically modify a live cell and make it selective for a certain Siglec. And thereby we hope to study the interaction of that cell with a, a Siglec and learn more about what this particular Siglec is doing. So the, the basic principle we are doing is uh, we are adding a unnatural sugar uh, that contains uh, an unnatural handle that we can use to do some click chemistry. Um, so that's the first step, basically adding this uh, handle. And then in the second step, we add this hydrophobic group that now will uh, give selectivity towards a certain signal. So the first step you're probably familiar with, this is a technology developed by uh, uh, Caroline Bertozzi she actually discovered that if you modify uh, manosamine with an alkyne handle or an azide handle, this is so small that it can be accepted by the biosynthetic machinery, and this alkyne is actually converted into the silic acid derivative, put on the protein, and actually expressed at the cell surface. Now, alkynes themselves, they are not found in, uh, in nature, uh, at least not in human cells, and um, they are unique but they're not visible yet. So for this you need a, a chemical reaction called a click reaction uh, with a, another unique component, an azide, uh, to form this triazole linkage. And if you have a fluorescent azide, for instance, you can now make this alkyne visible. So that's exactly what we did. We just simply wanted to use that technology, um, but we, yeah, we found some problems with this. So um, it's known that the alkynes perform better than the azides. Um, and basically 90% of people, they use manosamines, if not more, because they're uh, easily accessible and they're the precursor for silic acid. 
uh, we actually found that if we use silic acid based uh, analogs, so we basically enter the biosynthetic pathway a little bit later, this incorporation is much, much more efficient. And also we see the same difference between the alkyne versus azide. So here you can see manase, which is monosamine with the azide, um, and it's about five times less uh, efficient uh, if we compare to the alkyne silic acid. And there were even some cells that didn't even take uh, the monosamine. So this is, these are results for dendritic cells. They showed no labeling whatsoever with monosamines, but with silic acids they showed a very strong signal. So apparently the novel synthesis in dendritic cells is uh, not very efficient, or it's not there. So yeah, basically we think uh, you know, this alkyne silic acid enters the pathway a little bit later. That helps in the increasing the efficiency but it also may help in uh, shutting down de novo biosynthesis by this feedback uh, inhibition. So uh, added bonus is that also the silic acid derivatives, they are not toxic, uh, toxic at all, whereas if we use the monosamine uh, derivatives, we can see toxicity above uh, 100 micromolars in THP1 cells and about 50 in, in Yurkat cells. Then we also added this inhibitor I showed you earlier just to check if we could deplete the signal and in the case of silic acid derivatives, we could. We can see an 80% reduction in the signal, as we expected. But when we used the monosamines, we saw basically 60 to 70% of the signal remained. Um, so this signal, we think, arises from um, redirection of the MANAC pool into Glucnac and Galnac. So you're actually looking at different glycans. So this also means that the silic acid derivatives are more specific for silic acid. Here you can see this on the gel. This is the normal situation. Uh, here you can see the increased staining with the silic acid uh, uh, precursor compared to the manosamine precursor. And this is the three lanes when we add inhibitor. You can see uh, the signal is almost depleted in the case of silic acid, but uh, with the manosamines we can still see quite a bit of labeling, which is not originated from uh, silic acid. Okay, now the final part, just one slide, about these high affinity cyclic ligand expressing cells. We call them HASLEX. Um, so we now know how to incorporate this label efficiently, and we now clicked on three different um, azide groups and uh, on a live cell to program it to interact with one specific cyclic. So, for instance, if we do this with cyclic 7, then uh, azide 1 really. Uh, increases the binding to, to cyclic 7, even though the, the control cell already has some binding. Um, so there are some um, sort of wild type ligands that are recognized by cyclic 7, but uh, by clicking on azide 1, it's really increased uh, compared to azide 2 and 3, which are comparable to the control. So if you look at cyclic 4, it doesn't care about whatever azide you click, it's all about the same. Um, but for instance, for cyclic 2, which uh, does not bind uh, this cell and at all, but if we uh, modify that uh, silic acid with azide 2 we get uh, increased binding, so we can actually get this cell to communicate with, uh, with or bind to cyclic 2 um, We're not sure about communication yet, that's our future work, we want to see what are the functional consequences of modification of these cells, um, so we're screening more ligands, different positions on the silic acid, and also doing functional experiments where we look at this haslec cyclic uh, interaction. As I said, cyclic binding is really, really complex because um, actually cyclics are normally bound by their own cell silic acid in cis fashion. So you could um, basically increase the affinity of this uh, interaction and that would inhibit cellular signaling or you can let it communicate with a cell that has high affinity and that would then increase um, uh, or basically reduce the uh, immune suppression. All right, so with that, I would like to thank uh, my student, Torben Heise, who does all the chemistry. And I work with uh, Professor Hosse Adema and Christian Boel in the, the Rothbaud Institute for Molecular Life Science, and they did all the Im immunology. Thank you for your attention. Uh, questions, please, for the speaker. Myron. I have one, Thomas. Uh, very nice study. Um, uh, I'm interested in your sialic acid analogs. Uh, 
Uh, I guess the question here is uh, what is what is it targeting in terms of the uh, when it uh, when you add that to the cell? Uh, you sit there is a molecular mimicry of the analog. What is what's happening? Here? So which one? The inhibitors? Yes. Or the so the uh, inhibitor actually is a, a, a metabolic precursor of a very well-known and old inhibitor, CMP silic acid with a fluor on the three position. Okay. So people have made that. It's active in enzyme assays, but you could never get it inside the cell. So what is that? Is it targeting? All the silyl transferases. So you block all 20. Inside the cell. Inside the cell, yeah. We see a little bit higher uh, inhibition of the 2,6 silyl transferases versus the 2,3 when we look at recovery but uh, they inhibit fully if you add enough. So they all use the same substrate and that's actually the basis of this inhibition. And I guess my other question here in terms of your first presentation uh, with regard to uh, inhibition of uh, C elevation. And uh, the data you're showing here in terms of tumor growth and taxes, at what stage do you inhibit that C elevation at the it's it's not permanent. It's a competitive inhibition of the silo transferases, so it's a competitive blocker. Yeah, and uh, we let the tumor grow for ten days, then we add the compound and let it do its work. But we continuously inject. Thomas, I have a question as well. Actually, I was wondering about the metabolism of sialic acid. The the, the um, uh, the degradative metabolism of catabolic acid, of oh, sialic acid rather. So, do these cells actually turn over um, the sialic acid? Do, will they will they um, degrade sialic acid? Would they degrade your inhibitors given a time, a kinetic experiment? Uh, yeah, they recover in about three days. They, it takes three days for them to fully recover. Mm -hmm. So we uh, firmly inhibit them. Then we uh, basically give them fresh medium, and we look with lectin staining and. Uh, flow cytometry and it takes them three days to get back to normal levels of silylation. Uh, okay, now what, I guess what I was really asking is, so will they actually turn over the sialic acid? Will they, will they, um, will they catabolize sialic acid? The inhibitor, you mean? Oh, well, just normal sialic acid. Will they turn over sialic acid? Yeah, I think so. And what about the inhibitors? I think they just sort of diffuse away. Uh -huh. So if you give it time, it will diffuse, and uh, therefore it's no longer active. So is that you have to have a very defined time point then in order to do the experiment, right? Well, you have about three days, so yeah. Okay, thank you. Can we thank the speaker again, please?